Hello again, and welcome to our study on the book of Hebrews. Uh, we will be in chapter 9 today. Thank you for being here, and I just appreciate uh, appreciate you joining us and uh, the encouragement that I've received from many of you out there. And um, today we're, uh, we'll take a look at uh, um, redemption through the blood of Christ. We're also going to look at, at um, the actual inside of the, uh, uh, the tabernacle itself and see a little bit about that. We've, we've talked about Jesus, our high priest forever. Uh, we've talked about uh, the, the new covenant versus the old covenant. And uh, uh, with that, uh, we will get into chapter nine, uh, following a uh, word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, opportunities to study your word. Uh, Father, thank you for these beautiful messages that, uh, that just you just pour out on us. Uh, Father, thank you for uh, the views that we see uh, throughout it all. It's these pictures that uh, you have shown us. And Father, most of all, the picture of Jesus Christ and the redemption that uh, you have provided for us and uh, for our sins. In his name that I pray, amen. Uh, so uh, we've never seen um, this heavenly sanctuary that we read about here in the book of Hebrews. Um, but uh, Solomon and Stephen and, and, and the apostles point out that God did not actually live in the sanctuary itself, but his presence was there. We read about his presence being uh, with the people in, um, in Moses' time. Uh, in fact, uh, God was going to remove his presence from uh, the tabernacle uh, because of the, the people, uh, because of their disobedience. But uh, Moses convinced them to, to not not uh, leave them, but eventually uh, they were disobedient and God's presence did leave the temple. Uh, and, he's, and his people were cut off from having a relationship with God. Uh, even the, the Josephus records, uh, uh, Josephus actually records that the Holy of Holies was empty uh, from the, or after the Babylonian exile. Uh, though the temple still stood, uh, that temple was left desolate, uh, as we see even in Matthew chapter 23, verse 38. Uh, God was not in a relationship with his people. So let's read uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1 through 10. Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded, and the table, tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot speak now in detail. Uh, these preparations uh, having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section performing their uh, ritual duties. But into the second only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he uh, offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of Reformation. So recall that uh, this is written to uh, Jewish Christians uh, that are looking to uh, go back to the old ways and to uh, do this, those sacrifices again. So uh, the first covenant had regulations we see here uh, for worship uh, and an earthly sanctuary, an earthly place of holiness. Um, these regulations and practices were commanded by God. Uh, we learned that the fault was with the people uh, for not keeping God's laws. And that was what was the flaw with the... Uh, uh, first covenant, the old covenant. Um, therefore, the tabernacle 
and the first covenant became insufficient. But this was God's plan. Uh, notice that there are five things that the writer of Hebrews reveals uh, that make the earthly tabernacle insufficient. Uh, the first reason that the earthly tabernacle is insufficient is because it was constructed by humans. Uh, the tabernacle was built by Moses and the priest, not by God. Uh, being of this earth and being made by humans make it insufficient and inferior to the heavenly tabernacle. So the writer lists, number two, he lists all of the articles in the tabernacle. But in over in verse 23, which we'll get to in, in a, a few minutes, uh, we're told that these articles are simply copies of the heavenly things. These things uh, symbolize a greater fulfillment which is to come. Uh, I'm, one, I'm, I'm one here who believes that possibly the writer of Hebrews is declaring that Jesus is the fulfillment of these copies and shadows, verse 24. Did we just get a glimpse of heaven? Uh, I wonder about that. So this, it says, uh, these things are a copy or a shadow of uh, the heavenly things. So I think we just got a glimpse of heaven. All right. <clears throat> Look at what's in there. The lampstand. Uh, so the writer tells us that inside the earthly tabernacle was the lampstand. Uh, Jesus is the true light of the world. Look what it says in John 8, verse 12. Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. And those, um, so he is the true light of the world, and we are also supposed to be lights of the world. As we read in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 to 16, and the Sermon on the Mount, and also in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. But notice that Jesus here, this lampstand, uh, is light, but Jesus is the true light of the world. Hmm. Table of showbread. Uh, each, every Sabbath, um, the priest would uh, remove the old loaves and replace them uh, uh, with fresh loaves on the table. Uh, the old loaves were eaten by the priest, and those loaves were called the bread of the presence. Uh, only the priest could eat the bread, and it could only be eaten inside the tabernacle. Jesus called himself the bread of life, who is given to the whole world in John chapter 6. Re listen what it says. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of my wor uh, of the world is my flesh. John 6, verse 50 to 51. So then we see the uh, altar of incense uh, that uh, we read about here just briefly, uh, just a few minutes ago. The golden altar uh, stood in the holy place just uh, in front of the veil that divided the Holy of Holies from the holy place in the tabernacle. So each morning and evening, a priest burned incense on this altar. Um, it was... Uh, an intercession and a representation of uh, people's prayers going to God, uh, as we read in Psalm 141, verse 2. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest was to take the coals from the altar of incense and go into the Holy of Holies so that smoke would fill the room and cover the mercy seat. Jesus is our intercessor uh, through whom we have access to God and through whom we offer our prayers to the Father. Romans chapter 8, verse 34 says this, Jesus Christ is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. So next we look in, at the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, the most important piece uh, was the Ark of the Covenant. On the top of the Ark of the Covenant were the cherubim of glory covering the mercy seat, 
Uh, this was considered the throne of God where God met with his people in Exodus chapter 25, verse 10 through 22. On the day of atonement, the high priest sprinkled blood upon this mercy seat and the two tablets of stone, the law, was inside the Ark of the Covenant. Therefore, the law was covered by the mercy seat, which on the day of atonement was covered by blood. Jesus is the atonement for our sins, the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. Uh, we read in Romans 3, chapter 25, uh, Hebrews 2, 17, and 1 John 2, 2, as we see, um, uh, I'll, I'll read that in just a minute. Everything, it seems, in the earthly tabernacle was simply a symbol for the future greater reality that is found in Jesus Christ. So the third point that we learn about the earthly tabernacle was that it did not grant access to the people. Only the priest could go into the first section, uh, the holy place, and perform their duties. Uh, only the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies, or the second section, uh, to offer atonement uh, one time each year. A priest had to do the work on their behalf uh, to make atonement for their unintentional sins. Not only this, but the priests themselves had to make offerings for their own sins before they could make sacrifices uh, for the sins of the people. Even the high priest could not enter and perform his duty until he had uh, his sins atoned. So the fourth thing was that uh, the earthly tabernacle, uh, earthly holy place, uh, all of it was temporary. God had torn the curtain of the temple from top to bottom, signifying that he, we now had access to God through our high priest, Jesus Christ. But just because this barrier was removed by God does not mean that it is, man is incapable of creating uh, a barrier of his own, acting as if that barrier still exists. Uh, we can do that. Uh, we, we seem to do that. As the writer points out, uh, those who still uh, try to seek God under the old covenant are denying themselves the benefit of the new covenant, uh, which includes access to the holy places, of the heavenly sanctuary. So the Jews still followed the old law of temple worship, but it was about to end with the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple in AD 70, leaving the only way to God to be through Jesus Christ. So the problem with the first covenant and the tabernacle system is that these things could not uh, perfect the conscience of the worshiper. It only deals with the externals. Uh, the consciences were not cleared or cleansed, the worshipers knew that they had sinned, but the sacrifice did not resolve uh, the separation from God that we have. Our sins and our iniquities have separated us from God. Isaiah, I believe 59. It only reminded the worshiper of the sin. So these sacrifices did not uh, take care of our moral situation. They only dealt with the regulations for the body. Uh, so let's look at Hebrews 9. Uh, verse 11 through 28 then. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats, or goats and bulls, and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer, sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the, promise e eternal, the promised eternal inheritance. Once since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant, uh, from where a will is for where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes place or takes effect only at death, 
since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet, wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood, not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So uh, the heavenly sanctuary, ancient, heavenly sanctuary is far superior to the earthly tabernacle. Uh, we saw the contrast earlier, uh, but it's now stated. Jesus has appeared as the high priest over the good things uh, that have come. Uh, this happened through the greater and more perfect tent, the heavenly places. What makes this tabernacle greater is that it was not made with hands. Uh, humans did not construct the heavenly sanctuary. It is not of this creation. Jesus is functioning as the high priest in heaven in the heavenly sanctuary that is not a copy, but the reality, the real thing, the original. The tabernacle on earth was simply a shadow or a copy of, of the heavenly things. So, uh, this also deals with our sin this way. Jesus' priesthood is superior uh, because it effectively deals with sin, and the heavenly sanctuary is superior because that is where the true atonement is made. Jesus entered the holy places, not with the blood of animals, uh, but with his own blood. It is his own blood that effectively deals with, with our sin bringing us eternal salvation or eternal, or eternal redemption. Uh, the blood of animals cannot solve the problem of sin. Jesus' sacrifice is superior to the sacrifice of animals. Uh, further, the, the blood of Jesus uh, gives purification that the blood of animals was unable to accomplish. Uh, the blood of animals brought purification of the flesh. In verse 13, as we read, if the blood of animals can deal with the ceremonial uh, defilement and purification, uh, purification rituals uh, for the ex external body, then how much more can the blood of Jesus Christ deal with our sins? Uh, in fact, um, we read that it is the blood of Jesus that is able to purify our conscience, uh, consciences from uh, our sins. So the blood of Christ cleanses our conscience. Uh, wonderful grace of God. We can forget about our sins. It's gone. Uh, God says, I will remember their sins no more. We do not need to hold on to that guilt. Um, We do not need to be reminded of our sins on a regular basis. Uh, the sacrifice of Jesus takes away our sins um, totally. We have been cleansed uh, from our sinfulness to serve the living God. The blood of Jesus has the power to cleanse our heart and our, and our guilty conscience. 1 Peter 3.21 It's baptism that now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, 
but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus has brought us the new covenant in verse 15. And through his calling, we receive the promised eternal inheritance, eternal life. Jesus' death has redeemed us. Uh, through Jesus, we're set free. Through Jesus, we have forgiveness. Through Jesus, we are redeemed. Are you still struggling with um, guilt over your sins? Uh, if you are, then I hope this comes through to you, uh, that, that our sins are washed away. And you say, well, I've been baptized, and then my sins were washed away, but, but I still sin. Well, I want to remind you of uh, 1 John uh, chapter, uh, chapter 2, actually chapter 1 and chapter 2. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It says, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. He has died once and for all. We don't need to crucify him over and over. He has died for our sins. He's washed them away. So we have been baptized uh, as an appeal to God for a good conscience. So why do you still struggle with guilt or worrying about your sins. Uh, let it go. God has taken care of it. Jesus has this. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin, but to save those who eagerly await for him. I don't want you to get the idea that, that I'm saying once saved, always saved. That's, that's not what I'm saying. But Christ has, has taken away our sins. And if we, if we ask for forgiveness for those sins, he will forgive us, even if we sin after we've been baptized. And as we will find out next week in chapter 10, it is possible uh, to uh, to keep on sinning willfully, and we could lose that inheritance that God has given us. So he is coming a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who eagerly are waiting for him. Let's eagerly wait for him. Thank you. Uh, I pray that you have a great week, and thanks for being with me again. We'll see you next week in chapter 10. Have a great week.